All right, let's look at 2.6. So 2.6 is all about derivative of inverse functions. So um, there are two kinds of inverse function that we're going to talk about. The first one is trig inverse function, and the other one is general inverse functions. Um, so let's talk about trig. Uh, trig inverse function, let's first talk about how that's written. So when you see arc, and then you have sine x or cosine x or something like that, but that arc part, arc part just means inverse something. So um, that was a that was mentioned in the pre-calculus um, inverse function chapter uh, for trig, if you um, kind of don't recall. But anyways, this is kind of how it's written. When you see this negative one, that is not reciprocal function. Okay, so what does reciprocal function mean? Okay, so remember, if you have a x to the negative one, that is one over x. That's called reciprocal, right? But inverse function is different. If you have this, this is not 1 over f of x. Okay, please, please, please remember this is not the same. Inverse function means that you're basically finding the inverse of that function, not reciprocal. Inverse does not mean flip it over. Inverse means switch x and y. So please remember this. This is not the same. All right, so inverse function of sine, another way you'll see that is arc sign. Um, so arc tangent will come up a lot on the test and you know, so on. So please uh, remember. Um, so let's kind of talk about this a little bit. Um, I just want to kind of drill this in. All right. So inverse sine, this is not sine to the negative one. Okay. So this is an inverse function. This is reciprocal. So I'm really, really emphasizing this to drill it in. All right, now that we kind of uh, talked about it uh, for a while now, um, let's talk about the actual derivative. So the derivative of inverse sine x is 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared. And then, remember, chain rule always applies. So if there is nothing inside inverse sine and just an x, then this is the derivative. If, however, let's say that this part is, you know, let's call it f of x. Then the derivative of this is one over square root of one minus function squared. Okay, function squared, and then derivative of the function. So remember now that we learned chain rule, chain rule always applies when that inside function is not just a is not just an x if it's a function you know whether that is 2x square root x a, a cosine x maybe um anything else that is just not just an x you gotta do a chain rule so please be careful of that all right inverse cosine inverse cosine is negative one over square root of one minus x squared and again notice i'm writing x here x here because this is an x if i change it to any other function besides x, remember you have chain rule. All right, inverse tangent, 1 over 1 plus x squared. All right, now we get into the harder ones or the harder to remember ones. Inverse cosecant, negative 1 over absolute value x square root x squared minus 1. Inverse secant, 1 over absolute value x square root of x squared minus, uh, minus 1. And then last one, inverse cotangent, negative 1 over 1 plus x squared. Now, that's a lot of things to remember that doesn't seem to have a pattern. So uh, here's kind of uh, the big thing. So on the AP test, they will only ask you inverse sine and inverse tangent. So if you want to just kind of make a note that you just need to remember these two. If you take more calculus in the future in college or something, then uh, your professor will probably ask other um, derivatives as well. But at least for this year, you only need to remember inverse sine and inverse tangent derivative. 
All right, let's do this really quick practice. So for example, number one, find the derivative of the following. So derivative of number one is, remember derivative is just derivative of both sides. You know, whatever you do to one side, you do to the other side. So the derivative of y dy dx is equal to derivative of arc sine, arc sine two x. All right, so remember the derivative of arc anything or inverse sine of anything is one over square root of one minus whatever is inside squared. So that is two x squared times the chain rule. If there is a function inside, well, indeed we have a function inside. So times the derivative of that, which is two. And if you want to clean that up, so two over square root of one minus four x squared, you're good. So remember we're solving for the derivative, which is just dy dx. All right, let's have you try this one. Inverse tangent three x. So find the derivative of this. All right, the answer is three over one plus nine x squared. All right, let's try this one. Inverse sine of square root x. So go ahead and try this. All right, here is the derivative. All right, let's go ahead and try another one that kind of combines everything that we have learned into one problem. So find the derivative of this. So please be careful. You see here we have an arc sign. We have a product rule with a chain rule inside. So please be careful of all that uh, derivative going on. So go ahead and take the derivative. All right, go ahead and check your answer. Make sure that you have the correct thing. All right, the second thing we're gonna talk about today is the derivative of inverse function. So let's kind of review a few things about inverse functions. So what do you know about inverse function? Kind of recall from pre-calc. Um, we know that if we have a function then we kind of write uh, the inverse function this way, right? And what's the relationship between the function and the inverse function? Well, a few things we know. Um, so mm, we know that x and y switches in the function and inverse function. So what does that mean? That means if, let's say, for example, um, in the function, f of two equals three. So meaning like if you put in two as x in f of x, you get a three out. So that means you have the order pair two, three, right? You know, f of two equals three just means the order pair two, three. Then in the inverse function, because we switch x and y, because we switch x and y, we can guarantee that if we put in three in the inverse function, we're gonna get two out. So if we get put three in the inverse function, we're gonna get two out. So what does that mean? <laughs> it means if the x is two in the function, then that two becomes the y in the inverse function. So x and y switches. And same thing in the function, if three is the y in the function, then three is the x in the inverse function. Again, f and y switches. So another way to say that is if f of x is equal to y, then f inverse of y must get you x. So kind of do the reverse, you'll get the original thing out kind of idea. All right, what else do we know about inverse function? We know that, so since we ta we're talking about X and Y switches, then we know that the domain and range switches, if you kind of recall from last year. So the domain of F becomes the range for inverse, and then the range for the function becomes the domain for the inverse. So this is kind of the uh, one of the key ideas. All right, what else? What else do we know about inverse function? If you have two two functions and then um, you have to check to see if they're inverse of each other, um, then 
what do you have to do to check that they are inverse of each other? So if they are in the inverse of each other, then f of f inverse must give you x. And also, likewise, if you do the inverse function of the function, you will get x. Um, let's do really one quick example so you know kind of what inverse functions look like. So like, so let's say um, f of x is equal to, let's just say x cubed. The question is, what is the inverse function? Recall that if you want to solve for the inverse function, you switch x and y. So x is equal to y cubed, and then you solve for y. So cube root of x is equal to y. In this case, y is really what we're solving for, and we are sol we were solving for inverse function. So inverse function is equal to cube root y. OK, so this is the process. I'm going to erase this part and kind of demonstrate that. So let's say we put in a number to kind of say, for example. So if I put in 2 into the original function, what is the y that comes out? Well, if you put 2 into the function, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be cubed, so it's going to be, y is going to be 8. Then, remember, in the inverse function, if I put in 8 as x, I should get 2 out as y, right? Oh, I'm sorry. That shouldn't be a y there. That should be an x. Okay, so then we're saying if I put in x uh, equals 8 in the inverse function, I should get 2 out as y. Is that true? cube root of 8. Cube root of 8 is 2. So that is correct. So you see how this is how it works. You you put it, uh, the x and y of the inverse and the original function switches. And then also, let's kind of demonstrate how this property works out. So we put, we compose one function inside the other. We should get x out is what uh, it's saying. So let's try that. f of f inverse f of f inverse. So remember, composing means that we put this function in. The function itself is x cubed. So cube root x cubed is x. And then we can do it the other way around. So that's f, f inverse of x cubed. So put x cubed inside the inverse function, cube root of x cubed is x. So this is how um, quick review of the inverse properties. So what we have talked to so far is all just pre-calc um, information. Now let's talk about the calculus part of it. The whole idea is, you know, based on what you have known about the inverse function from pre-calc, now we're going to talk about how to take the derivative of an inverse function. All right, so let's look at the function and the, and, the, um, and the inverse and then see how they're related in terms of their derivatives, okay, in terms of their derivatives. So um, let me kind of do this in a different color so you can see that. So we're going to take those two same functions from before, and let's kind of figure out their derivatives. So for example, um, the derivative of this function, f of x, is 3x squared. That's pretty easy. And we're going to do the same with this um, uh, inverse function here. So the derivative of cube root x. So first, I want to change that to a x to the 1 third. So it's easy to derive. OK, so the inverse function, oof, oh, let's, this is a little hard to write. Inverse function derivative. Okay, so that way we don't have like a negative one and the prime next to each other. Um, so the derivative of that is going to be one third x to the negative two thirds. All right, good. Now we're going to plug in those numbers and see how the you know derivative of the function is related to each other with its values. So in this function, I'm going to plug in two, and then in this function, I'm going to plug in eight. Okay, so then the inverse, uh, sorry, the function, the derivative of the function at 2 is 3 times 2 squared, which is 12. 
and then the inverse function derivative at 8 is equal to 1 third, 8 to the negative 2 thirds. All right, so this is where you take out your algebra skills. 8 to the two, negative 2 thirds is a little bit hard to do, so I don't know if you remember from algebra 2, we would like to change uh, 8 into 2 to the third. If we change that, it, the problem is much easier to do. 2 to the third to the negative 2 thirds. The threes cancel, so it's going to be 1 third times 2 to the negative 2. 2 to the negative 2 we know is um, 1 fourth. So it's 1 third times 1 fourth, which is 1 twelfth. Now let's take a look. How are these two derivatives related? Well, it's pretty easy to see, right? One is the reciprocal of the other one. So <coughs> this is the key takeaway. Uh, the key takeaway is that the derivative of the function and its inverse are reciprocal of each other. <laughs> so I know I'm talking about inverse and reciprocal a lot, so hopefully you're kind of keeping that clear in your mind. Inverse is the one with the negative one. Reciprocal is you actually flip the fraction. Okay, so the key takeaway. The key takeaway here is the derivative of the function is equal to the reciprocal of the derivative of the inverse function. And likewise, the derivative of the inverse is equal to 1 over the derivative of the function. All right, now let's talk about how to solve these problems. So these are the type of problem that you're probably going to see on the AP test where um, you know, even though we know all this information, we can't really solve these questions quickly unless we have a very quick shortcut. So I'm going to kind of show you the shortcut. All right, so let's look at this one. The function f of x equals this thing is 1 to 1 and differentiable. The key here is 1 to 1. So 1 to 1 means what? So 1 to 1 in the math language means it has an inverse function. So it's saying f of x has an inverse, and it's differentiable. So that means every single point, every single x is differentiable. Uh, find f inverse of 1. Find f inverse of 1. Notice how this function is very hard to find the inverse. So remember uh, last year when we talked about finding the inverse, you switch x and y and you solve. Well, if you switch x and y, you change all this to y, it's impossible to solve, right? So that so the whole idea is not for you to solve the inverse function and then find the derivative then how are you going to figure out the derivative of the inverse function at one all right here's what you do you construct a table so this the table is key <laughs> so we're going to practice constructing the table a lot all right so how what do you um fill in the table with first you write x then you write y and then m M, remember, means derivative because M means slope, right? Slope or derivative. All right. Then on the side, on the column, you write the function, the inverse function. All right, now what you're going to do is you're just you're just going to fill in everything you know from this question into the table. All right, function is equal to this thing. Cannot fill it in. Find f inverse prime at 1. Find the derivative of the function at 1. Find the derivative of the function at 1. Okay, so that means x is 1 for the inverse function. And they want the derivative. Remember, derivative means slope. So they want the derivative at 1 of the inverse function. OK. Now, you got to remember the, what we had talked about with derivative and uh, with the function and its inverse. So the relationship between the function and the inverse is that you switch x and y. Therefore, if 1 exists in the inverse function as x, then it must exist in the original function as a y. Okay? 
And then we're kind of going backwards. So if y is 1 in the original function, if y is 1 in the original function, then what is x? If 1 is the y in the original function, what is x? Well, you probably look at it and say, I can't solve this. You're right. You can't solve it. You're going to guess. <laughs> You're going to make your best guess. What do you think x has to be so that the whole thing becomes 1? What does x have to be so the whole thing becomes 1? Well, x has to be 0. It's, it's always going to be something that you can guess really quickly. So 0 plus e to the 0 is 1. So this is 1. So x is actually 0, which means this is 0. All right, now we come to the key part of this. We want to figure out this part. We want to figure out this part. But remember, the relationship between the function and its, uh, the derivative of the function and the derivative of its inverse is that it's a reciprocal of each other. OK, what does that mean? That means if I were able to find m, I can just find 1 over m later, because I know that's how they're related. Right? So. Our whole goal here is to find the derivative of the function at 0. So now, let's find the derivative of the function at 0. So the derivative of the function is 3 plus e to the x. We want to evaluate that at 0. So 3 plus e to the 0 is 4. So 4 goes here. The answer is 1 fourth. OK, that's a lot of information. Let's try another one to kind of practice that a little bit. OK, let f of x equals this thing. What is the value of inverse x when x is 3? What is the value of the inverse function when x is 3? x is 3 in here, right? x is the 3. X 3 is the x for the inverse function. Therefore, 3 must be the y for the original function. So 3 must be the y for inverse function, because that's how they're related to each other, right? x becomes y, y becomes x. All right, again, you're not going to really solve it. You're going to do it by guessing. What do you think x has to be so it's e so this function is equal to 3. Kind of do your best guess, right? So what does x have to be so the whole thing is 3? All right, so you, you might have to kind of do a few guesses, right? So let's see. If you put in 1, you're going to end up with a fraction, so it's not 1. If you put in 2, 2 cubed is um, 8, 8 divided by 4 is 2, 2 plus 2 is 4, minus 1 is 3. Ah, yes, x is 2. All right, next one. What is the value of f inverse when x is 3? What is the value of f inverse when x is 3? All right, let's go ahead and try our table method since we're practicing the table. So x, y m, m means derivative, function, inverse function. What is the value of the derivative of the inverse when x is 3? That means 3 goes into the inverse function x. We're looking for this one. If x exists in the inverse function, then it must be the y in the original function. If it's in the y, of the original function, we can go backwards to figure out what x is equal to, which we did in the previous section, 2. So 2 also goes here. If we can figure out the derivative of the original function at 2, we just need to find a reciprocal, and then that would be the answer. So let's do that. The derivative of the function is 3 fourth x squared plus 1. The derivative of the function at 2 is 3 fourth 2 squared plus 1, which is 4. So we put 4 here. 
This is the reciprocal, so it's one-fourth. All right. Let's try, let's have you try one yourself. Okay, so construct the table. X, Y, M, F, F inverse. This one's a little bit trickier because they kind of say it in a different way. Suppose that f of x is this. g is the inverse function. What is g prime of 4? What is g prime of 4? If this is very confusing for you, substitute in. They're saying, what is the inverse function prime f4? Remember, g means f inverse. Therefore, g prime of 4 means f inverse prime f4. Okay, so that means four goes here. All right, so let's go ahead and have you try to solve this question and then come back and check your answer. All right, the answer is one seventh. Okay, let's have you try another one. This one, no numbers, it's just very a lot of letters. Um, so we're going more hypothetical or, or conceptual. So same idea though. Um, go ahead and pause this video and try this. All right, this one is a little bit trickier because everything is in terms of ABC. So it says that G, G of X is inverse function. So when you write this down, if you know it gets really confusing, you're like, whoa, there's F and G, then you might wanna write this as well, just so that you remind yourself G is the inverse of F. Okay, so a few things. First, you always kind of want to go to the question stem. What are they asking for? They're asking for the f, f prime of b. f prime of b, that means b is the x for f, and that means we're solving for the derivative. Um, if this must exist here, then this must exist here, right? Then you go back to the question and you look at it and say, oh, g of a is b. G of A is B, that means B is the Y for G, and then when um, B is Y, then X is A according to this part. So that means this also exists here. Then if we know the derivative of, the, of G at A, which we do, then we just go back and find the reciprocal and then we have the, the actual derivative. 